Hi, I'm Brayden, this is Hank, and this is Sarosh, and we're doing the development and application of high-resolution imaging with regards to microbiome with SEM and TM, TEM microscopes. Um, excuse. Um, so when learning about microbiome and the organisms that uh, live within it, um, one of the greatest challenges is finding uh, microscopes that are capable of viewing the extremely small organisms um, that live within at a high resolution. Um, two of the microscopes that are capable of doing so are the tunneling electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope. Um, these microscopes both use a beam of electrons to, um, to scan the, the subject, um, what you're looking at under the microscope. Um, however, the scanning electron microscope only looks at a topographical view of the subject, and the tunnel electron microscope uses electrons to um, pass through and create a, a more in-depth uh, image. Now, what we're trying to find out is what is the better microscope for, the micro for uh, researching in the microbiomes, the SEM or the TEM, and how we could possibly improve these methods. Um, by knowing which microscope is uh, more capable, we could come up with new ways to improve their respective resolutions um, in order to uh, better understand the chemical and physical makeup of whatever you're looking at. Now, microbiomes are in a lot of things, from the human body to global precipitation and agriculture, as, so, as shown in the slides. And it is extremely important in medicine because if we figure out how the microbiomes work in the human body, we could pre-diagnose certain disease, diseases and figure out how they work and possibly cure them. Okay, so now currently scientists to study the microbiomes, they're using two types of electron microscopes so that they can see the smallest objects. They're using the SEM and the TEM. So the SEM is the scanning electron microscope. Now some of the advantages of this microscope is that it's easy to use and takes a topographical image, which means it only shows like the top layer, so it's good for studying like the surface and the shape of that, and it requires minimal sample preparation. But on the flip side, it only images the surface, which doesn't show us the inside of the organism we're trying to study. So if we want a more in-depth view, we should be using a TEM microscope. And it's also very sensitive, so we have to take special precautions to make sure there's no extra vibrations in the environment, and you also have to get a, a table that can, that can get rid of those vibrations. It's a thing. It's an now, IQ game, big table. Yes. <laughs> now the TEM, or the Tunneling Electron Microscope, is easy to use, just like the SEM. And it is very easy to convert the images to a 3D model, and the magnification of the TEM is five million times what the naked eye can see. Uh, we can take both large and small sections of the subject, so if we want to see a group of cells or a single cell, and we can also view inside the cell. But on the other end, uh, the technology is very expensive, and it's very tedious and time-consuming. It can take anywhere from a couple hours to 20 hours to produce a single image and it requires extremely specialized training to work these microscopes. And the samples have to be extremely thin for the electrons to pass through. And they ha the samples have to be able to tolerate a vacuum chamber so they don't get damaged. And the images also render in black and white, so it's really hard to see color. So now our proposal has to do with increasing the resolution of the images produced by the TEM microscope, which we which we decided was better for this purpose because it shows the inside of the cell. So every object vibrates and the molecules are always moving around. So when the microscope wants to take a scan or an image, it's obviously hard to do when all the molecules are moving around. So what we want to do is try to slow down the molecules without damaging what's inside the cell. So right now there's a method called cryo-SEM where basically they freeze the cell, but the problem with that is we can damage the cell and the bacteria inside of it, which makes it hard to study. So what we did was we looked at a study conducted by Northwestern University that uses a beam to slow down particle motion. Now this beam is a broadband laser light that has multiple frequencies. What the researchers did was take out all the frequencies 
that would increase the molecular motion and only left the ones that would decrease it. So therefore, they're able to cool it without damaging the molecules inside. So now, they've already done this before and it's been used and proven that it works. So as you can see on the slide, our, there's a case study. It was used to cool aluminum monohydride molecules from room temperature to four Kelvin, which is almost a 290 Kelvin difference in a matter in less, in less than a second. Now, the challenges that we're going to face are that introducing a uh, cooling laser is very hard uh, in a TEM because it could introduce new particles like photons and it could disrupt the images because you need uh, reflection to get the image. And the cooling could also possibly damage live cells uh, prematurely. Plus, plus the uh, introducing the cooling laser into the TEM is very expensive because the TEM alone is roughly $500,000 to a million dollars. Um, with new methods uh, in science comes change, and if these techniques become relevant, um, nanomicroscopy would change. Um, with a new understanding of the microbiome, uh, the only plausible uh, decision would be to take the new information and use it to its full ability in order to understand uh, the way microbiomes work and uh, how everything inside works. Now contributions, we all worked on it. And then references. <laughs> <laughs> applicable to a biological sample, right? Like in this, based on, they were doing a very simple inorganic system to demonstrate a, basically a physics experiment, right? And that's where many developments in measurement like microscopy start from. The question is, can you apply it to a biological structure, right? I think that if applied in the right way, as in uh, cryo-SEM, you have to do it in a very specific way in order not to damage the cells. I think that if it were to be done in a way that didn't damage the uh, organic molecules, it could work, but that would also be difficult and require some research in order to pull off. So it just depends on how much time you have. Basically, basically what we're trying to do is improve the resolution of the images. So right now, both the SEM and TEM obviously do great work. But the biggest issue is that with the molecules always zipping around and vibrating in solids, it's hard to get a clearer picture. It works the same way on the micro scale as in like on the macro scale. If you're trying to take a picture of a ball flying through the air, it's hard to do. But if we're able to slow down that motion, we are able to get a deeper image and we're able to see more details, which will help our studies. So it, yes, it makes perfect sense. Like the issue really isn't like proprietary interests, but it's more about the fact that this technology can be incorporated into nanoscience in order to help us produce clearer images. 
So like, it's not a matter of, of which one is better, but a matter of using that kind of technology to further a different branch of science. She also asked if like, the scientists could work together to further it. Um, I wouldn't know if scientists could work together on that. Like, that's a proprietary issue that's between them, honestly. And I think the bigger issue, you know, we do a lot of instrument development here, is that historically you tend to get technology in search of the problem, right? You get people making things that are really cool and they can do something, but it doesn't have a sort of scalable, broadly applicable purpose. And I think what's shifting over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years or so is really bringing the people developing technology together with the people doing specifically, you know, interesting research areas to develop technologies that are specifically designed to address a need, rather than just making some cool new gadget that produces a paper and a news story, but then doesn't ever any, have any real world impact. You know? So part of what this course was about, the initial things that these students read about was the need for new tools for the microbiome, the need for new tools for the brain initiative purpose-driven instrument development, not just developing a technology for the sake of showing you can do something fancy, but to do it in a way that actually addresses a real-world identified need from scientists, from physics, from chemistry, from the medical field, and everywhere in between. And that's where nanoscience, through sort of interdisciplinarity, really lowers the barrier to that happening. Because in this building, we've got people that have real problems, and we've got technology development, and they're all working and collaborating together. So I think that what you're pointing out is a lot of historic, it, it's true historically, it's the mindset is shifting a bit. As you start to sort of break down the silos of traditional departments, and you get people talking to one another. The proprietary side is always a tricky one, just because we do necessarily work with companies at some level. I mean, if you wanted to add this technology, for example, to RTEM, that's a $10 million microscope made by a company. <laughs> you know, we would have to collaborate with them, and there are balancing acts that should be struck when you do that. But it's certainly it not anything that we don't uh, attack if it's, if it's necessary. And so it's still going towards um, development if it makes money, or is there, are we now finding that uh, these advancements that these leading students are looking into, um, that it's enough that it will Yeah, I think that actually it's been historically the other way around. You saw more basic research happening in the last 50 years than you tend to see now. The shift tends to be more now towards actually application-based or translational science, where you have to be addressing a particular problem, like the willingness of the funding agencies to support basic discovery-based science, especially in the United States, is not as vigorous as it has been in the past. A lot of companies don't invest in basic industry, you know, research and development. Uh, so it's, it's, it definitely goes through ebbs and flows. Um, you know, whoever's in Congress and is deciding the budget affects the Department of Defense, Energy, NSF, NIH, CDC, all the funding agencies. So the mindset of the federal government also affects these things. I think, I don't know what Rob would do to say, but it seems to me at least in the last handful of years that a focus on applications has been on the uptick more so than basic science. Um, that's not necessarily only in the perspective of sort of working with or enabling companies to make money. It's that people are asking, you know, what's the impact of this science that we've been investing in? Especially when it's hard to see. Yes? Um, about stock in motion and all that stuff. I'm a, I was a, I'm a film major. A lot of ways of stop in motion is to move the limbs, hand with the action. So um, instead of like freezing the molecule, or you could develop an instrument that can move with the subject matter. I know that's going to be impossible. Well, <laughs> not, well, right now, theoretically, it's impossible because we don't know how you're going to predict movements of the molecules or whatever, but you could develop an instrument that moves with it, then you're gonna get more sharpness with it, because you're, you're moving relative to the speed of that molecule. So that's one, one approach where you guys can think about these things. 
Yeah, I mean, that's definitely one way to approach it, but I think that molecules move in such an erratic pattern that yeah, that would be yeah, quite yeah, hard to, yeah. to develop tracking software that could predict its movement. Yeah. So. You know, from stopping its motion, you could also gain control of its motion. Yeah. And maybe instead of freezing the water, have it move up and down at a predictable frequency that then you can compensate for with your equipment. So this idea of using a laser to adjust molecular motion has applications besides just stopping it. So I think it's, it's very interesting and innovative, you know, cutting edge technique.